Good morning. Uh, this morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 13 on page number 849 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these, these are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Vivi. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here today. Uh, well, I think there's probably not a, a subject that captures the fascination of Christians uh, m more than the subject of the end times, right? Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, the Bible teaches it. We, we, we know that Jesus is coming back someday. And so uh, in many ways, there's, there's always this fascination of when is that going to happen, how it's going to happen. Book of Daniel teaches it. Book of Revelation talks about it. What we're looking at in chapter 13 talks about it. All over the Bible, we hear about Jesus' return. So maybe some of you remember uh, back, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, the, uh, the Left Behind series of books, this book of, you know, 12 books in a series. Uh, that uh, to date has sold more than 75 million copies. In 2001, the ninth book in that series was the best-selling book in the world. People are clearly fascinated by the end times. Now, I'm a child of the church. I grew up, uh, my parents faithfully took me to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. I was in youth group. I mean, I did the camps. I was a, I was a church boy. And, and one of the recurring themes I heard growing up was, get ready, Jesus is coming back. I mean, any day now, Jesus could, so I mean, the evangelist at the youth rallies would always be like, are you ready? Because you can go out and get a car accident, Jesus might come back, right? Whatever. It could happen now. And, and there was just sort of like, I, I, I don't remember a lot of sermons growing up, but I remember all of those. I was scared to death mostly. You know, we had these movies of people being beheaded, and it was horrible. I mean, it was just this very frightening time. But Every few years, it seems like we have this recurrence of somebody who steps up, some group, some, some uh, pastor or something that stands up and, you know, predicts that Christ is going to return, and he's going to return, you know, imminently. And so back in 1988, some of you will remember, some of you were like, I wasn't even born, which is really weird, but uh, uh, that, uh, that there was this book called 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988, and that didn't happen, of course, and so they wrote one called 89 Reasons He'd Return in 89. Uh, they finally gave up, apparently. I actually went to uh, uh, see a, a guy. Some of you don't will remember him if you're real baseball buffs. I'm not. I just went to see him, but, but his name is Greg Gagne. He played for the, the Kansas City Royals. No, 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 Minnesota Twins, sorry. And, uh, and I went and saw him speak one time. He got saved after reading that book just freaked him out. Oh my gosh, you know, and Jesus is coming back. Uh, last year, you might remember Harold Camping, okay, this nut job of a pastor who, who basically says that the world was going to end on May 21st, 2011. Well, it didn't, and so on May 22nd, he revised the date sometime in September of 2011, and now I guess he's just in hiding. Um, 
every few years, there's this group that, uh, that'll publish in newspapers, I mean, prominent newspapers. They'll take out full-page ads that, that, that declare that, that there's eight reasons why, uh, compelling reasons, why Jesus is coming back very, very soon. And, uh, and so they, they print them out, and you, you better get ready, and, and here they are. Okay, so listen to this. Number one, Israel's rebirth as a nation. It's one of the precursors to Christ coming back. Well, that happened in 1949. Number two, plummeting morality in the world. Number three, famines, violence, and wars. Mark chapter 13. Number four, increase in earthquakes. Mark chapter 13. Number five, explosion of travel and education. I hadn't heard that one. And then uh, I look and they, they, they refer to Daniel 12, 4 that says, many shall run to and fro, I guess that's the travel, and knowledge shall increase. So if you're traveling and you're educated, you're part of the end times. Congratulations. <laughs> Number six, explosion of cults and the occult. Number seven, the new world order through increased centralization of finances and political power. And number eight, an increase in both apostasy, that is falling away from the faith and faith itself. So there you go. Now, why do they say that? Why do they come up with these eight reasons? Because they look at their Bibles, they look at Scripture, and they go, hey, it looks like we're talking about here, we're reading what we're seeing in the world. And so, so I mean, you Fill, people fill up conventions over this stuff. People flock to hear, you know, the guy on the TV with those. You ever see this guy with the massive charts behind him? I'm stretched from one side of the stage to the other. I'm really sorry, by the way. I'd love to do that for you. But, um, you know, I mean, it's just incredible. You know, here's all that's going to happen, the, the way it's going to happen. I mean, just everything. It's, 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 it's amazing. So if you're one of those who are fascinated by the end times, then great. You've picked a great time to come to Foothill Church. Well, sort of, because for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about, Jesus is going to talk about um, the end of the world, if you will. Uh, But I want to warn you, uh, it may not be what you think. I don't have any charts, uh, and I don't have any predictions. So we're going to just look and see what Jesus says. And so let me put this in context for you, okay? Always, always, always read Scripture in context. The way you get in trouble and the way you start making all kinds of weird interpretations is when you yank Scripture out of its context, and you can make it say anything you want it to if you do that. Okay, now remember, the book of Mark, chapter 13 of the book of Mark is part of, go figure, The whole book, right? And the whole book is what? The whole book is telling you, here's who Jesus is, and you ought to become a follower of Jesus. So I can look at chapter 13 and go, wait a second. Mark didn't just suddenly run off on a rabbit trail to tell us this thing about the end of the world. Mark is still telling us something about following Jesus. He's still telling you and me about what it means to be a disciple. And we're supposed to read it through that lens and understand something more about uh, being a disciple. So, so in some ways, Mark and, and Jesus is going to teach us. He's going to try to galvanize, you understand, make stronger the faith that we have. Okay, so I want, you, I want to point out just, just three things this morning, a couple of sub points but I, 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 that, that are going to help us understand what discipleship is, okay? And the first thing I want you to see from this, this chapter is, is, is that Jesus is the center of our worship. Now, now follow me and let's do this together, okay? Chapter 13. Uh, verse 1, and he came out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, let me, let me explain to you what I mean by Jesus is the center of our worship, okay? Chapter 11, since chapter 11, verse 27, remember, Jesus walked into the temple, starts teaching, starts actually getting a bunch of confrontations, and then starts teaching. Now, what is the temple? The temple is quite literally the house of God to the Jews. Okay, now, it has an interesting history, right? God says to David, I want you to save a bunch of money, and then you give it to your son Solomon. Solomon builds this magnificent temple. He he erects it. they, They sacrifice 
tens of thousands of animals, the glory of God descends in, in a thick cloud, uh, the Bible says, to the point the priests couldn't even go into the temple. It was, it was the presence of God. They took the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they stuck it into this place called the Holy of Holies, which was this sort of inner sanctum inside of the temple, and that was understood to be the place where God rested his feet. It was his footstool, and, and this is where God came to dwell among his people okay and 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 now over time Israel turned its back on God they rebelled against God and so you you you, you get this uh, place and I think it's first Samuel 4 where Eli the priest he's kind of a wicked he's not a great high priest and he's got these wicked sons and and so they're fighting with the Philistines and they take the ark of the covenant of the Lord out to fight with them and uh, and, and the ark gets captured and Eli you know as he's coming back somebody runs back and says the ark of God has been captured Eli falls over back Backwards, hits his head, dies. His daughter-in-law gives birth, and she names the son uh, that she gave birth to Ichabod. Okay, in in Hebrew, e kavod. Kavod means glory, and it literally means the glory of God has departed. And she says, because the ark of God has been captured. So the, the presence of the Lord for them is gone. And so it goes to this history where finally the Israelites are taken into captivity by Babylon and Syria. And the temple is burned to the ground. And, uh, and so Nehemiah and Ezra come back. They erect the temple again. And it's a very sorry, sad replica of what Solomon had done. It ends up falling into ruins. And that takes us all the way to the New Testament. And when you get to the New Testament, you, you have uh, Rome in power. And over Palestine, you have Herod the Great ruling. And if you go to Israel, we're going to go there next year. And if you want to go, talk to me about that. But uh, if you go to Israel, you'll see that part of what you do when you go to Israel is you go see all the places Herod built. Because if he was nothing else, he was a crazy man. But if he was nothing else, he was an amazing architect and builder. And he built some of the most magnificent structures of the ancient day. And one of those was the temple. Okay, it, had, it was gone. And so he went up onto the same temple mount. He was a smart politician. Uh, and he thought, I'm going to make these Jews so, so that, you know, we don't have these factions going on. And he rebuilds the temple for the Jews. Let me show you what he did here. And this would be in your, in your uh, uh, ESV study Bible if you have that. Okay, so this is essentially a replica uh, uh, or, or a, you know, a, a depiction of what it would have looked like. Okay, so uh, over here on this side, you've had the Kidron Valley, and, and over here, kind of the, the, the this was a, 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 this is where the trash heaps and things down this slope would have been where the city of David was. Uh, this pinnacle right here is where they talk about Jesus, Satan taking Jesus up on the pinnacle of the temple and saying, throw yourself down. Okay, this is it. This is a 30 five acre complex built by Herod the Great. You could fit 12 football fields up on the top of that thing. Okay, it was just massive. It is massive. It, it, in fact, pretty much the whole flat part of this is still standing. Okay, and, but, 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 uh, but you know, we'll see here in a second what happened. In the temple, Josephus tells us there were some stones that were 60 feet long. One stone. If you go today down around the base over in that corner, uh, the, the tour guides will take you and show you that there are, there are stones that are 42 feet long. They are 11 feet high. They are 14 feet deep. They weigh over a million pounds. One stone. Incredible what's there. It was one of the most magnificent structures in the ancient world. Now, let me show you more of a close-up of the temple. So that's the whole mount, and then there's another picture I want to show you. So there is kind of zooming in on the temple, and notice um, it was larger than any other temple of its time. It was twice the size. I mean, Herod was great, and Herod decided, well, Solomon's was wimpy. He made it twice the size of Solomon's temple. The front of the temple, as you can see, was covered with gold. The reflection of the sun, of the sun off that gold, you could have seen for miles. And, and it was the pride and glory of the Jews. You looked at that and said, oh, that is the place of God. That is a suitable palace for us our God. Uh, no, no wonder the disciples are utterly blown away. They had never seen anything like this up in the Sea of Galilee region. But notice 
Jesus isn't impressed. He looks at it and he says, I, I know what's going on here. It is externally magnificent, but internally it is Ichabod. The glory of God has departed, right? Until the day, chapter 11, verse 24, that Jesus, God in human form, walked back into the temple. And then it departed again when he walked back out, right? Now, in fact, while Jesus is there, you remember from last week, the only thing that he found inside the temple grounds, inside the temple itself, that he could commend was one little widow who gave everything. It's the only thing. The only, only thing that he has positive to say about what goes on in that temple. And, and, in, and in chapter 13, verse 1, we hear that Jesus came out of the temple. Now that is not, you, you shouldn't pass over that too quickly. Because here again, the glory of God is departing and it will never, ever, ever return again. Because Jesus is going to say, this isn't it. This isn't it. Now, now, look at what the disciples in. Do you, do, so he says, you see these great buildings. There will, be, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And it happened just like Jesus said. Okay, you go to Israel today. The flat part is still there. But in 70 AD, the, the Roman general Titus, under orders from Caesar, rides into Jerusalem and he utterly destroys the temple to the point that most archaeologists don't even know where the temple exactly was located. They know it was up there somewhere. They think it was, you know, sort of in the middle, whatever, but they have no idea. Josephus, a first century historian, said this, the city was so completely leveled as to leave future visitors to the spot no ground for believing that it had ever been inhabited. Now, do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us, look, look beyond, look beyond the facade to the reality. He wants us to see beyond the present to the future. This is all going away. I am going to upend what you think your hope is. I'm going to take this out from under you. Do not bank your hopes on this. Now, this had to be totally shocking for the disciples. Okay, I mean, historically, listen, J Jesus is saying, guys, you're, you're putting your hopes in the wrong place. This thing is going to be destroyed. The center of what you think your worship is will disappear. Don't put your hopes there. Put them somewhere else. I've got another location for you. I'm going to tear down the things of your life that you put your hope in until it's left with just me. You see what's happening? God will dislocate. He will disrupt, he will crush the location, the things that Israel had put its hope in to say it's not about a place, it's about a person, and that person is Jesus. See, if this book is about making followers of Jesus, then it is equally about destroying things that keep us from following Jesus alone. So it's a great question for you to ask yourself. Where are you putting your hope? See, I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen to every single one of us. You're going to discover there's things, there's big things, there's really massive things in your life that you put your hope in, and God will upend those. Some he will utterly destroy, a president, a career, a spouse, a child, whatever, to say, I want, I want to leave you with me, and I want you to see that I'm better. I'm a better temple. I'm a better hope. So when Jesus walks out of, this, out of the temple never to return, he's making a statement. And when he says this place will be destroyed, he's making a statement. This is not where your hope lies. Your hope lies in me. You trust me. You follow me. You worship me. Because the difference, fellas, between this temple and me is that this temple will be destroyed and never rebuilt again. I'm going to be restored, re destroyed, and in three days I'll rise again. You put your hope in me. See, this is what's going to happen in just about 48 hours from when this, this took place. See, then you're going to worship me. Then you'll know that the temple that you're supposed to worship at isn't made with human hands. And you come and you worship me. Jesus, Jesus is the center of our worship. 
Okay, now let me show you something else. Number two, he says, be, be careful of misinterpreting signs. We have to be very careful, okay? Now, look at verse three. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so he's sitting in the position of a rabbi. They would sit down, they'd sit down in front of him, and he's, he's on the Mount of Olives. So if you left the, the temple across the Kidron Valley, you'd, you'd drop down, you'd, you'd run back up onto the Mount of Olives, and there it was said, you could sit, and you could look right in basically to the back doors or the front doors of the temple. So there he's sitting, and he looks over there, and, and Peter and James and John and Andrew ask him privately, hey, Jesus, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? See, now, uh, they, they come out, and I think the disciples are wondering, did we hear you right? Did you just say this thing's going away? A and, and I think what they're asking, what's going through their mind is, if that's true, then this must mean the end of the world. Now, why do I say that? Because in Mark chapter 24 and verse 3, there's a statement that, I mean, Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, there's a statement that, that, that the disciples add at the, the same episode where they say, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? In other words, they just heard Jesus say, okay, now what's the sign? Apparently this means the world is coming to an end. Now isn't that interesting? When the object of our hopes comes crashing down, what do we usually do? We go... It must mean the end of the world. <laughs> Good Lord, did you watch Facebook this week? I mean, how many people had put their hope in Tuesday? And when it either did or did not turn out, and mostly did not turn out for people that I'm talking about, when their hopes were dashed Wednesday morning, it was the end of the world. Right, the, 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 This must mean, you know, Jesus is coming back. See, somehow we link our hopes and dreams to what God is doing in the world. Never mind, by the way, the more ter far more horrific things are happening in other countries. It's just when it hits American soil that we freak out, right? And if our hopes are dashed, then God must be bringing this in thing in for a landing. But watch this. He's not. At least not the way we think. Look at verse 5. And Jesus began to say to them, now, now listen carefully. See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. Did you hear that? For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. If you have the King James, like I grew up with, it said in divers places. I never knew where those were. Um, there will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Here's what I think is happening. Okay, now, um, here's what I thought growing up. If some, you know, wingnut like David Koresh or Charles Manson said, I'm Jesus, then that meant, oh my gosh, Look out, Jesus is coming back, right? If there's earthquakes in Guatemala, which I'm assuming is a diver's place, uh, then, then that means, uh-oh, then it, it could happen now. I mean, it's, you know, watch out. Let's all start collecting bottles of water and, and get a generator because Jesus is coming. And if, and, 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 and if there's wars and there's rumors of wars, get ready. All these things mean the end is imminent. The destruction of the world is going to happen. I'm just saying that that's what I understood growing up. I remember, um, believe it or not, I remember the, I think it was 1979 peace accord between Israel and Egypt. I think it was Anwar Sadat and I forget the, Menachem Begin, I think that's who it was. And, uh, and I remember being like, oh, Israel and Egypt just kind of declared peace with one another. That's great. And then somebody told me, oh, no, no, because the Bible says when they say peace, then comes destruction. I'm like, oh, crap, man, everything. <laughs> I just can't get, this is terrible, right? Okay, so the destruction of the world, right? All these things happen. That means, man, this is going to happen tomorrow. Now, look, 
That is exactly the point Jesus is not making. Did you see that? He says the end is not yet. He says these are the beginnings of birth pains. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, many of you ladies have had children. You know labor can last for hours, right? I mean, just out, with Michelle, it lasted 18 hours. It was horrible for her. Uh, um, <laughs> but what does it mean, right? Now, sometimes you experience false contractions, right? And I think they call these Braxton Hicks or something like that. And, and usually, you know, the, the, the lady or the, her husband and wife will run to the hospital and the doctor will say, well, go home. It's not yet. Okay. And they wait. But, but look, it means the baby is coming, but not right now. It's coming. I told you a few weeks ago about when Michelle and I had Gabby and all these hours that she was in labor. Well, it was coming, but not right now. Now, now within Judaism, motherhood in Jesus' day was the ultimate validation of a woman's worth. And birth pains, interestingly, ended the disgrace of childless, childlessness. Okay, so that was a disgrace. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying about today. I'm saying for them, that, that's what it felt like. So, so what Jesus is saying is that the birth pains the church experiences throughout history, by the way, and, 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 through the, and all these trials, right, validate her existence. They don't know not, all those things that you'll experience, that, that Christianity, that, that the persecution and all these things of, that Christians go through and the, the, the earthquakes, you know, Paul says the earth groans waiting for its adoption. All these things are, are the earth telling us that, that the child is on the way. Jesus is coming back, okay? Please don't hear me uh, being like, that's not happening. He's coming back. We don't know when. What, what, what the birth pains don't tell you is the exact time of delivery. I mean, some ladies, they get birth pains and boop, you know, baby pops out. Michelle, 18 hours. Some people, 24, four. I mean, just ridiculous amounts of time that you ladies wait, by the way. I'd be like, give me medicine and let's do this thing, right? Um, so you don't know the exact time. It's, it's the pains are upon you. And it doesn't tell you anything about the exact time. See, here's the thing. We want to know the future, don't we? We'd love to know. Man, Jesus, just tell us. Tell us it's going to be, you know, December 25th or whatever. I mean, just tell us. We want a date. But Jesus unflinchingly directs his people, his disciples, to the present. See, present tense. Watch out that no one deceives you. I don't want this happening to you. He doesn't want us to get preoccupied with speculation, right? Jesus doesn't list all of these things that are coming to make us speculate. He lists them all to make us watchful and faithful in the present. See, the child is coming. We know that. What we don't know, is it today? Is it next year? Is it in 500 years? We don't know. And if we, what happens when we get too preoccupied with it? It becomes the only man. You know, I'm trying to put all the tea leaves together to make sure, is this all, you know, here's all the order of events, here's everything. And, and then we stop thinking about what it means today to be a disciple. See, see, Peter says that to God a day is like a thousand years. And when people say, well, hey, how come, how come Jesus still hasn't, re God hasn't returned? How come the Messiah isn't here uh, again? Then, then Peter says, well, look, to God a, a day is like a thousand years, and God is so patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. A day is like a thousand years. I actually started doing the math on that one day. We were, my dad, some of you know, my dad died on May 1st, so it's been about six months. And we went up to go see my mom. We're coming home, and I'm driving along, and, and I start just thinking, a day is like a 1,000 years. Okay, so I'm doing the math. Okay. And uh, so it dawns on me that that, that means that, that my dad, since May 1st to today, has been in heaven about 45 seconds. <laughs> like, hardly enough to turn around. Just got there. I mean, he's probably up there just like, hey, you're here too. No way. I just got here. This is crazy. Right? <laughs> a day is like a thousand years. God's not in any rush from, from, from heavenly perspective. 
See, what we're called to do as followers of Jesus is simply be ready and live expectantly. Jesus is coming back. The end will happen someday. It might happen in our lifetime. It might happen today. You know, it could. There's nothing that we're waiting on the clock to happen. It could happen. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe it's the next century. I don't know. What we must not do is allow ourselves to panic or to predict by making a wrong diagnosis of the contractions that are going on in the universe. You see what I mean? Okay. So, so we, don't, we want to be careful about interpreting the signs. Now look at the last thing Jesus says. Jesus predicts Christians will face hardship. Okay. All right, now... Uh, let's look at this. But be on your guard, for they'll deliver you over to councils, and you'll be beaten in synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Okay, now, what Jesus is going to do in this section is he's going to call us, if, if this whole section is about living in the present, not freaking out and, and, and making these, you know, airtight predictions about the future, then, then that's what he's doing as well in verses 9 through 13. This is still saying you live presently. This section this is not a section on how bad things will get someday when Jesus is about to return. It's saying that these things may happen to you and me today. Okay? Now, now let, me, let me explain what I mean. I think there's a couple of things I want to say under this. First of all, Jesus is saying we may have to suffer. Okay, look, you, you, councils and synagogues and beats and all. I mean, look at ver, verse... verse uh, Verse 11, and when, you, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you're to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak but the Holy Spirit, and brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Now, this shouldn't surprise you if you've been a Christian for very long. And if you've read the book of Mark, right? I mean, remember back, one of the very first things when Peter confesses, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and, and Jesus says, you're right. And flesh and blood didn't reveal these things to you, Peter, but my father who's in heaven. And then he says this, if anyone would be my disciple, he will take up his cross and deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. <laughs> that, we, we, don't, we don't preach that very often, do we? You want to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, every day's Friday, right? <laughs> Just love God and your life will be... Look, Jesus says you deny yourself. You this is a violent image. You take up your cross. This is suffering. I mean, the, 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 Jesus has never shied away from this. See, see look at I love that Jesus doesn't sugarcoat things for you or for me. He tells it like it is. You're never, we're never going to be able to say to Jesus, whoa, 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 right? you didn't tell me it would be like this because he tells us all the time, take up your cross, deny yourself. There's going to be beatings. There's going to be things that happen like this. He, he says in John 16, right, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He says, people will hate you for not my name's sake. You see this over and over. Some will be handed over and beaten. Some will be put on trial. Some put to death. For some, the gospel will be such an offense that it will divide families. And you think, really? Yes. And do you understand, this is not talking about the future. This is talking about now. You understand these things are happening now, <laughs> right? And, 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 and if they aren't happening to us in America, you should thank God for that. See, but just because we don't experience them doesn't mean they don't occur. This weekend is the international day of prayer for the persecuted church. Churches like us are talking about this. Because there are people all over the world who read verses 9 through 13 and go, it's happening. 
It's happening to us, right? I mean, bombs are going off in Africa and in the Middle East, killing Christians. Christians are being put on trial for blasphemy against Allah and Muhammad. Torture, kidnappings, rape. All these things are happening today. There's some research that says every five minutes, somebody is martyred for their faith in Christ in the world. This is happening. Jesus isn't saying, follow me, and man, everything will be great. You have all the money and wealth you want. That is an American perversion of Christianity. He's saying, you take up your cross, and for some of you, it will mean hardship. For some of you, it will mean outright persecution. But Jesus says in the midst of that, don't you worry. The Holy Spirit will be with you. The Holy Spirit will will gird you up. God will not abandon you. He will empower you in the midst of your worst crisis. That's the promise. See, we, we, we will have to suffer. And then Jesus says, we will have to witness. Look at the second part of verse 9. He says, You'll be beaten in synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. There is something about persecution that, that pushes Christianity. Right? Can I say something? I think, I think one of the lessons of this past week, and I'm not talking about the president, so please hear me. All over, there were resolutions being voted on all over this country And I think one of the lessons for us as Christians is, my friends, we are losing the culture war. And we are no longer a Christian nation. I mean, we are living in a culture that is becoming increasingly secular, from the the redefining of marriage to the legalization of recreational use of marijuana. I met a gal yesterday, last night, after the 5 o'clock service. She's from Colorado. I was like, congratulations, you guys can smoke pot. Way to go. (laughs) Awesome. We need more pot smokers, don't we? Uh, (laughs) To the lack of the protection of the unborn and the sanctity of life. I mean, guys, look. And here's what I'd say. I'm not not saying you stand up, you rail against the machine. I'm saying, as a result, isn't it true that our witness is as urgent as ever? You see, as Christians, we don't shrink back when the days are evil. And they're evil. We move forward. These are the times when, when the message of the gospel is most needed. And isn't it interesting that Jesus talks about witness in the middle of persecution? You're going to be my witnesses. This is where it's going to happen. And in fact, the history of the church proves this, right? You have, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts, you have this, this persecution. Stephen gets martyred, and boom, it causes what's called the diaspora. The Christians just, they just run, right? And what happens? The gospel is spread all over the world, within, the known world, within about 100 years. To almost every major city in the Roman Empire within the next 100 years. See, see, we do well under persecution. The gospel, I should say, does really well under persecution. 1555, one of, the, one of the leaders of the Reformation in England, his name was Hugh Latimer, and his partner in crime, if you will, was a guy named, they called him Bishop Ridley. And these guys were on the forefront of this. And Queen Mary was Roman Catholic, and she hated them. And so she put them on trial for heresy. They were convicted. Uh, they, were, they were sentenced to be burned at the stake. And they brought them out. They tied their hands, put them on the stake, fueled the fire underneath them. The executioner came with the flame. And as he was coming, there were witnesses that said that Hugh Lat- Latimer raised his voice and shouted to Ridley. And he says, be of good cheer, Ridley. And play the man, we shall this day by God's grace light up such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. That's what happens. <laughs> Look what God does. He bears us up. Many historic, I mean over in history you see have come after intense times of persecution. God, listen, God wants people to be saved because God wants to be worshipped. And many times, he accomplishes that 
by allowing his people to be persecuted. You see this? And then let me just show you one last thing. We must endure to the end. Look at verse 13. You'll be hated, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. See, the whole point of this is, see, I don't think chapter 13 is here going, everybody start looking at the tea leaves. It's not that you'll go through all these trials. You may not. It's not even that every Christian will face all these things right before Jesus comes back. I don't think that's his point. Rather, what Jesus is saying is, let me, let me show you some, some horrific things. And Jesus is saying, no matter how difficult it becomes, don't punt. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give in. Hang in there. Why? Because the one who endures to the end will be saved. I don't think he's talking about saved out of that trouble. I think he's talking about eternal salvation. He'll be saved. This is, this is why Reformed guys like me believe in this doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. You, you endure. Who, who do we know? Who's Christians? Well, you know what? We'll find out for sure when we're all in heaven. They endured to the end. And if you're wondering if you can make it, if you're wondering if you can stand the pressure and endure, the answer is you can and you will if you're a genuine Christian. You know why I say that? Because that's the promise of Scripture. Paul says in Romans chapter 14, you will be upheld. You will be, for the Lord is able to make you stand. Now, let me be honest with you. Some of you saw that I, I wanted your prayers this week because as I'm reading this, I got to be honest, I'm reading this and going, we don't feel any of this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not scared Tucker's going to turn me over to the authorities. I'm not scared of being hauled before councils and governors and kings and being put to death. See, what concerns me is not that many or most or any of you will face severe hardship and persecution. Like, I don't know the future. M maybe we're going to. Maybe we are. M maybe America is coming to a place where we're going to undergo severe persecution. I don't know. What concerns me is that in America, in Los Angeles, in the San Gabriel Valley, we have adopted a kind of Christian religiosity that gets blown over by much, much lighter winds. People punting because it just got too hard. I didn't get as much in my paycheck this week, so I guess this Christian thing's not worth it. It is so weak and so frail. Because we have bought into the lie that Christianity is supposed to work for me and it's supposed to make my life better and it's supposed to mean every day's Friday and when it's not, we say, this thing isn't real. This is bogus and it is because that's not Christianity. You see, what Jesus is doing is saying, I want to make sure you're not putting your trust in something flimsy, in something that can be shaken. For God alone, I was just reading this this week, for God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For he is my hope. I put my trust in him. I will not be, he's my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. See, see Jesus is saying, you, you put it in me not in how good your life can be right now. I want to give you faith that can withstand the worst persecution. You may never go through it, but I want to give that to you. And if you'll follow me, in fact, look, I think he's going, guys, guys, look it. Read verses 9 through 13. Remember these. Let them ring in your ears because in just a couple of more days, he's saying, you're going to watch this unfold before you. You're going to watch me go through the worst 
possible uh, persecution that anybody could under, under, uh, undergo themselves, right? I, I'm going to show you what it looks like for God to sustain you through the worst valley and the most horrific trial. I'm not asking you to go anywhere I haven't been. I'm not asking you to endure anything I won't endure first. Do you see this? I mean, Jesus will be handed over to councils. Jesus will be beaten. Jesus will stand trial. Jesus will be betrayed by a brother in Christ into the hands of these people. He will bear witness, though, to the gospel. He will be, he will be sustained in the midst of hatred, and, and the Holy Spirit will undergird him, and he will endure to the end. And if we can say it this way, Jesus will be saved. And if you say, well, yeah, that's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Okay. Then all you'd need to do is turn over a couple of more chapters, a couple more books to the book of Acts, and you would see Acts is a commentary on verses 9 through 13. It's going to play out with real people just like you and me in living color that will be put on trial, hated, beaten, betrayed, put to death. See, okay, here's my question. How strong is your faith? See, I got to tell you, one of my concerns is that I see a lot of people who I'm not sure that your faith is your own. I don't know if you're riding somebody else's coattails. I don't know if you just kind of like being around this religious environment, which is so lame. I, 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 I can't imagine anybody wanting to do that. Or if it's, I own this. How strong is your faith? Is it a faith that can withstand the worst persecution? Is it a faith that says, I trust in Jesus? Or is it blown over and set back by the slightest wind? Jesus isn't asking you to prevail over all your adversity. You know, there's a Goliath in your life, and you gotta, you got to muster up the strength to do it. He's saying you can't do it, and he's just saying this. You do the only thing you can do in a crisis. You hold on. You endure. You be steadfast. Can you do that? Will you take up your cross and follow Christ by standing firm to the end? Is that the kind of faith you have? Jesus never, never, ever promised you a life of ease. He promised to be with you in adversity. He promised that your life would then bear witness about him. And he said, man, if you do, then, then you will be saved eternally. That's the promise. Let's pray.